Okay. So welcome to the 28th Annual Distinguished Statisticians Colloquium, sponsored by Pfizer, ASA, and UConn. As you know that this is a very famous event in our department, and it's a part of our 10th, 60th anniversary <coughs> package. Uh, but those of you who don't know about Pfizer Colloquium, it started long time back, with first speaker being uh, Professor C.R. Rao. Today, we honor the distinguished career of Dr. Malai Ghosh, but first, it is my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, the undergraduate program director and associate professor in our department, Dr. Elizabeth Schifano. She will tell more about the Pfizer Colloquium history. So welcome to the Conover Auditorium at the Dodd Research Center. Please note that in case of an emergency or fire, there are two exits from the auditorium. One is the main entrance located at the rear of the auditorium. The front emergency exit is located off the stage to your right behind the podium. Please note the nearest exit to your seat. We would like to remind you that there is no smoking allowed throughout the building and to turn off or silence your cell phone during the program. Please be aware that this program is being filmed and live streamed. We recommend you confirm that your mobile phone is silenced. Restrooms are located down the hallway toward the parking lot on the left side. Thank you for your attention. So the Pfizer Colloquium began in 1978 and has been continually supported by funding from Pfizer Incorporated, the Yukon Department of Statistics, and the American Statistical Association. This joint initiative was started under the leadership of Yukon Professor Harry O. Poston, Poston excuse me, and Dr. David S. Salzberg, formerly of Pfizer Global Research and Development. After Professor Poston's death in March 2002 and Dr. Salzberg's ret retirement from Pfizer, UConn Professor Nidas Mukpadie and Dr. Naiti Ting, then with Pfizer, served as program leaders for their respective organizations. Dr. William T. Dugan of Pfizer succeeded Dr. Ting in August 2009. Now, I am delighted to introduce Professor of Statistics at the University of Connecticut, Dr. Nidas Mukpadie. Greetings. Uh, can you all hear me? Okay. I'm going to introduce um, our distinguished speaker, distinguished uh, statistician who is visiting us. So I'm honored to introduce Dr. Molay Ghosh, distinguished university professor from the, from the Department of Statistics, University of Florida, Gainesville. After he received a PhD degree in statistics, 1969, from the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill under Professor P.K. Sen, he dedicated significant parts of his career to a number of illustrious centers of learning, including the Indian Statistical Institute, Calcutta, Iowa State University, Ames, finally settling down at the University of Florida at Gainesville around 1982. He maintained close ties with the U.S. Bureau of Census and the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Dr. Ghosh continually moved from one area of research to another seamlessly, making landmark contributions in statistical science, from sufficiency ancillary Basu theorems to non-parametrics, to sampling theory, to foundations, to Bayesian theory, to decision theory, to small area estimation, to sequential analysis and almost everything in between. His mastermind is equally at ease in developing the theory as well as methodology. Every area seems so natural in his hands. Dr. Ghosh is an elected fellow of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, the American Statistical Association, and an elected member of the International Statistical Institute. 
His awards include the S.S. Wilkes Memorial Award from the ASA, Maurice Hansen Lecturer of the Washington Statistical Society, the Small Area Estimation Award, the Lifetime Achievement Award of the International Indian Statistical Association, and the Jersey Neyman Memorial Medal from Polish Statistical Society. That was in 2015. He edited the journals like Sequential Analysis, 1996 to 2003, and Sankhya Series B from 2007 to 2011. He co-edited prestigious volumes, co-authored two books, authored 300 plus major research publications and advised 40 plus PhD students. I'm sure that these numbers are severely underestimates. Today, we have gathered here to celebrate the life and work of Dr. Moller Ghosh. As his first PhD student, uh, long back from ISI Calcutta, I'm thrilled that Dr. Ghosh will deliver today a special lecture some glimpses of small area estimation, which will be filmed for ASS archive of the films for distinguished statisticians or of distinguished statisticians. I proudly present to you a wonderful teacher, mentor, advisor, collaborator, and yes, a long-time confidant, Professor Malaya Ghosh. I feel honored and really have a humble feeling. I was looking at the list of the previous speakers and I was finding the names of people like Sia Rao, Dear Cox, Brad Efron, and many others. I had been here once in connection with this conference and that was interviewing my major professor, Professor P.K. Sen, a very distinguished person. So this is my second visit related to the Pfizer Colloquium. Thank you indeed. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'll talk about some of my own ideas. Glimpses is the right word. Uh, small estimation has now become a very big area and my students can possibly teach it for a semester. There is material which can go Bianca Parthos teaches it for Partha Lahiri, who is here, who is here, teaches it uh, for a whole semester, but it can go beyond that. But I will take only a few things, actually st starting with what it is, some of the few basic things, and then give you a few small nuggets which have come up recently, mainly because of, based on my own research. So let us move. So I'll give an introduction what small area estimation is, talk about synthetic estimation. That's how the subject got started. That's why I'm, and model-based estimation uh, with area level models only I'll talk about, but it could be unit level. And few recent things like relatively new things, I would say, benchmarking, fixed versus random effects, the areas which have worked. And now what I'm working on is variable transformation. And then I'll make a few list of areas I have untouched and you will find that the areas I have touched is only a minuscule fraction of what is left. So start at the very beginning. What is small area estimation, right? It is one of the several statistical techniques involving the interest of parameters for subpopulations in a larger survey it could be a small geographical area, county, census tract, school district even. But the question is, it could even be states, I will mention. Uh, it can refer to small domain also, cross-classified by age, sex, and other demographic characteristics. For example, we can talk about ethnicities, the 
I did one work with Myron Katsoff and his colleagues, National Center for Health Statistics, where we were interested Asian subpopulations, people without health insurance, proportion without health insurance in Asian subpopulations, that kind of thing. The emphasis is, it is not just the area, but the smallness of the targeted population which constitutes the basis of smaller estimation. That's what it is. As I said, for example, if a survey is targeted towards a population of interest with prescribed accuracy, the sample size in a particular subpopulation may not be adequate to generate similar accuracy. Now, why does it happen? I might have not said it. The problem is that once you conduct a survey, you typically don't have additional resources to conduct a second survey which will give you the prescribed accuracy for the so-called small areas. As a result, if you use the same data as such, the direct survey data, the result will be you won't get your desired precision. So a domain estimator is direct if it is based only on the do domain-specific sample data and small if it is not large enough to produce the desired precision. So how do you do it? How do you handle it? You have to handle it. My own example is once we conduct a survey in Florida, it was the, again the proportion of in the counties of Florida, people without health insurance. And then, actually that is the only time possibly I designed a survey with, with one of my colleagues, student Cindy Garvin. And then the very next year say, okay, we have a sample of 17,000, but you want to use it for 9,000 census blocks. So you can imagine, most of the areas had zero population. So one needs additional data, be it either administrative data through covariates in the original survey, data from other related areas, and these are indirect estimates. They borrow strength to quote Tukey, for variables of interest for related areas and time periods to increase the effective sample size. And this needs implicit or explicit or at least implicit use of models. Uh, just a few historical remarks, not very relevant but possibly now. It was there in 11th century England, 17th century Canada, based on either census or administrative records. Demographers has, have been using that, indirect methods. They did not coin the term, uh, uh, they did not use the term small area estimation earlier. Uh, they did eventually. Uh, I'll mention the name also. And the important thing is, small area now has become a worldwide thing. The demand for has greatly increased. The need is for formulating policies, programs, for allocation of government funds, not just in US, almost every country. And I have been associated with a Euradia a project where there are seven European countries who are involved in small area. Legislative acts by national governments have created a need for small area statistics. The one which is most popular in the United States now and have a huge source of data is called SEPI, small area income and poverty estimation mandated by the U.S. legislature even in the mid-90s. Hmm. What about this? No? I'm trying to use this one. Yeah. So demand for private sector has also increased because business decisions, those related to local areas, also rely heavily on local socioeconomic conditions. And small area estimation is of particular interest for economics in transition, actually, once they got out of the Soviet bloc, I mean, areas like Poland and other places, all, all the, most of these two European countries, uh, former Soviet Union countries, and they moved away from centralized decision making and sample surveys started getting used all the more. A few examples, I won't be able to cover most of them except possibly the median, just a glimpse of the median household income, uh, overall prevalence of adults, 
Modelby's County Estimates of Crop Acreage. This is a classical paper uh, by uh, George Matisse, Rachel Harter, and Wayne Fuller. And the classic paper of Fay and Harriet, 1979, which everybody referred to, uh, several, possibly, I don't know, 1,500 citations at least. Income for small places, model-based county estimates of the proportion of K-12 children, that is 5 to 17 typically, under poverty, median household income, I'll talk a little bit about it. And one thing where Bartho, Gori, and others, they have made substantial contribution, but I haven't, empirical and hierarchical based methods for small area poverty measures. So let's now go to the synthetic estimation. If a direct estimation for a large area covering a small area is used as an in indirect estimator for that area, for example, you are thinking of estimating something in one of the counties of Connecticut, you take it for the whole state and use the state estimate. Not very good, but that was used. First used by the US National Center for Health Statistics, a strong underlying assumption is small area bears the same characteristic for the large area. Small area mean for one of your counties. For example, I live in Florida, the small area estimation for Alajua County is a similar as the small area estimation of a certain thing for the state of Florida. If uh, a little bit of notations, and there are more, sorry for that. Y1, Y2, YM are the direct estimates of average income for M areas, population sizes, capital N1 to capital NM. Just check the overall average, Y bar S, and estimate for area I. Not very good. What is the idea? The mean squared error compared to the direct estimator will be small, but that is bias. So the variance you are reducing, but if there is substantial bias, the mean squared error is the variance per square of the bias, then you are in trouble. Heavily biased estimate is a genuine problem. An example is due to Maria Gonzalez and Christine Hosa a long time ago. Someone told me they are the first who coined the term small area estimation. I don't know exactly. So develop intercentral estimates of various population characteristics from small areas. So think about unemployment. A larger geographic division, small area is a county. Now county is a small area, geographic division is a large area. So think about the proportion of labor force in county I. Corresponds to cell J. By cell J, I mean the big geographic division. So U J is the corresponding unemployment rate for cell J, the ge geographic division. That's where you had adequate s sample. So what is the synthetic estimate? You take PIJ and then let's use the UJ, even for the county I, the overall average. They talked about regression estimate, but that's okay. Now, people started thinking more. They thought about, well, why go only for synthetic estimator or direct estimator? Let us try to take a weighted average of the two. And these are the things they called composite estimator. The motivation was what? Balance the design bias of the synthetic estimator because you are taking for the whole area and large variability of direct estimators. How to do a balance? I'll just illustrate with something very simple. Say yij is a characteristic of interest. Xij is a vector of auxiliary characteristics, take a, for example a scalar. So we have the population means, we know the overall average of, let us see if I can focus it, you need the, if I can't, I, oh, this may be tough, <laughs> uh, overall average of the auxiliary variables, so sample observations are yij, and you know y bar, yi bar, xi bar, based only on the samples, but now, sure I am not in the screen. What is the direct ratio estimator? You take yi bar over xi bar multiplied by capital xi bar which you know that's it. But the, the small area people will use ratio synthetic estimator where instead of yi bar and xi bar they will use y bar s and x bar s. 
that is the ratio, the average, the overall average. But what composite estimator is doing, the first term is ni over ni yi bar. That is sum of all the observations you have seen. The ones you have seen, leave them as it is. Leave them unperturbed. And then, for the rest, use the synthetic estimator, the ratio estimator, y bar s over x bar s, but you have to still multiply by x bar i prime which is the average of all the auxiliary variables which you have not seen. But how do you find it? You said you don't know the xi j's for j from ni plus 1 to capital mi, but you are still trying to use the x bar i, and this is a very trivial formula. You know the overall average, capital xi bar, and because of capital ni xi bar, the overall total is the sample total plus the unobserved thing. So x bar i comes very easily. There is indeed a model-based justification as well. I have to be careful so that I can. And it was given, it looks obvious, but the paper appeared in JASA also in those days, a model-based justification of the same estimate. Very simple, I took the very simple one there. Take yij independent with B X I J, the slope and the variance. And the variance is also depending on the auxiliary variable. So take the best linear and biased estimator of B by minimizing the sums of squares and you get B hat is Y bar S over X bar S. And now estimate Y I bar, the ones you have seen, summation Y I J, J from 1 to N I, and those unseen divide by capital N I, that's the overall average, and then for those unseen, if you put B X I J, B hat X I J, that's it. You get the estimator which was given previously. So you can see that although you may not have to talk about this model-based estimator, you still implicitly using a model for small area estimation. And now I'll be more formal. I will talk about model-based small area estimation area level models. Now small area models, what they do? There is a sampling model, that's the data, and random area specific effects. That's what it is. That's the starting point. Now it has become more and more sophisticated, space and time. You can use both. Uh, both Partho and Gori have contributed a lot in that area, space time. But I will talk about the simpler thing, very simple. So, but we'll classify, at least I'll talk about the two basic classification. First, the area level models that relate small area direct estimates to area specific covariates. Directs, you have an estimate for a certain area, you have a covariate, just like it. Such models are necessary, most of them, because unit level data at a lower level, the micro data, that may not be available, especially for people like us. Secondary users of survey. We don't have access to micro data. People in the Census Bureau, if you collaborate with them and take oath that you don't disclose the data anywhere else, you can do that. But in general, that is not available. So area level models are more used than the unit level models. A few cases where unit level models can be used. I had a Brazilian colleague, Fernando Mora, who once gave me some data, and together we could use a unit level model for certain application. Uh, so unit level model relate the unit values of a study variable to any specific covariates, mostly unavailable, but if you are available, use it. Or sometimes even unit level models, you had the unit level data, but you have area specific covariates. One time, Partho and I wrote a paper on that, and that was possibly in the 80s. So near 40 years ago, I guess. Anyway, indirect estimators based on small area models we'll call model-based estimators. Now the question is, so what are the advantages? One is, if we assume the model, it can be derived under the, uh, easily. You can get optimal estimators based on the given model. 
you can ask about robustness and other things. I'm not talking about it right now, but I'll talk about something else later when I talk about benchmarking. Second, area-specific measures of variability can be associated with each estimator, unlike global measures, often used with traditional indirect estimators. Third, models can be validated from the sample data. Okay. Fourth, one can entertain a variety of models depending on the nature of response variables and complexity and see which one fits the data better. The most important, Danny Pfefferman told me this is the most important one. Fifth, the model-based approach can provide estimates for small areas even with no samples in them. As I was talking earlier, 9,000 census block with a sample of 17,000, imagine how many census blocks are empty. One of the key ongoing application of model-based estimation is small area income and poverty estimation, as I mentioned, project of the US Bureau of the Census. That's actually what we flashed. That was the logo. If, you, if someone has seen the logo, that is the sampling model, yi equal to theta i plus ei, a classic model. Theta is xi transpose b plus ui. And target is estimation, if you call it prediction, that's fine, of theta i. It is assumed that the ei are independent. I'm not assuming normality, means zero variance DI, but they are known. And immediately someone can raise their hands, do you really know the DIs? Answer is no, but why? I will tell you. And the area level effects are, of course, IID, UI, A is unknown. The assumption of known DI put to question. Sure, they are sample estimates. Suppose we say that, well, we'll try to estimate. With the area level data, you just cannot. Because look at it. You combine yi equal to theta i plus ei, theta is xi transpose b plus ui, you will get yi, that's your data, you don't know the theta is, xi transpose b plus ui plus ei. So you can estimate ui plus ei, but you cannot individually do anything. In order to avoid this non-identifiability, if statisticians say non-identifiability, you have to assume that di is unknown something to that effect. But if you have microdata, then it can become a very different story. Just some notations. I don't want to delve too much. Dicky, this time, let me see if I can read it. I get back too many, too much. Quite a bit. Let's try The y is the vector of the direct observations, e the error. Let me give it up. U is the random effects. X is the matrix of covariates. B is the regression. So we assume X has rank P less than N. So in vector notations I write. Don't worry about the formulas. All it is, you find the best linear and bias predict. Those of you who have been in statistics for a long time or even you know what that is. In a linear model course, mixed model, they will always talk about best linear unbiased predictor. I get the formula for B tilde. And the V is the diagonal. You can see that D1 plus A, Dm plus A. And as you can see that, you can use the V. You can estimate the V, but you cannot estimate the ones uh, directly. That's why the DIs are assumed known, and BI at the shrinkage factor. Let me make one comment here. Look at it. The definition of the BI, DI over A plus DI. DI are the sample variances, and A is the model variance. So if DI is very small compared to A, what will happen? These BIs are going to zero. That means sample variances are much smaller than the model variance. So what should the estimate do? It should lean towards the sample average, the sample mean. It is actually, you can see that it is going to yi. Conversely, if di is very big compared to a, then what happens? Then the bi is going to 1. Then it is better to get linear estimate more towards the synthetic or regression estimate rather than the direct estimate. 
why I. The BLAP is also the best under assumed normality, but there is an alternative Bayesian formulation just mentioned because I will use the term. You think about the yi given theta i, normal theta i di, and theta i given b a normal with b in xi transpose b and variance a, the Bayes estimator still becomes 1 minus b i over y i plus b xi transpose b, just like the blob. The Bayes and blob are alike, and the bi is di over a plus di. So if instead we put a uniform prior for b, then the estimator, I'm sorry, this is not blob, if instead we put a uniform prior for b, flat, flat prior, then the Bayes estimator is same as the blob, which we talked about. But a is also unknown, the Bayesians will put a flat prior, and Carl Morris is the first one, in a different context, talked about it. But small a people initially tried to not go for this hierarchical prior or hyper prior. They used to go for estimating A using an empirical base, or imp and they call it empirical blob, whatever you like to call. So solve iteratively the two equations. You can see that V is unknown, but assuming V is known, you can get the generalized least squared estimator B tilde. Now use a method of moments. If you equate summation expectation of the thing in number two, if you just equate it by i minus two n minus p, the second, the last line of this slide, then it is n minus p. And now solve iteratively the two equations. Now, Prasad and Rao has a very, very well-cited paper. They wanted to es estimate the mean squared error. They said that iterative method may not be too convenient for analytical studies. So what they did for the B, they did not get the best estimator. They just got the least squared estimator, which is B L hat, L for least squares. And then if you equate this quantity, the residual sum of squares, you get this thing, you do not get, oh, I missed that, uh, m minus p times a, actually, but that's okay. Uh, you get that thing. And then, all you have to do, you estimate the a by the least square estimator, and that is a by the, uh, this particular estimator. But finally, when you're estimating the regression parameter, regression coefficient, you as use this non-optimal estimator and you get a closed form expression. Not necessarily the best, I'll mention later, actually just very, uh, not even discuss. There are better methods. Method of moments is not the best method for estimation, as we know all statisticians. In fact, there is a very interesting paper in Statistica Seneca by Partha and Gori, but they got instead the ML estimators, and the ML estimators definitely perform better than method of moments estimator. No question about it. Now, Prasad and Rao found an approximation to the mean squared error. So, you use the subjective prior for the theta i. I'm using now the Bayesian terminology and then the empirical base by plugging in estimator for B first, B tilde A, as if you know your A, and then put in that particular estimator, B i hat L, because B, B i is also depend on A, they are D i over D i plus A, so once you estimate A, you have to estimate B as well. That's what they did. The interesting thing is, by their method of estimation, is something like the uncorrelation between something of that sort, odd location statistics and even location free statistics, that kind of thing, you can break up the mean squared error into three pieces. The first term is the Bayes risk, that's my terminology, you can call mean squared error, if both B and A were known. The second term is the additional uncertainty due to estimation of B when A is known and third term is extra uncertainty due to estimation The 
interesting thing is you can directly estimate the first two terms very easily di times 1 minus bi you have your estimate for bi the second one is also an explicit expression estimate the b estimate the v fine the third term is tougher you get only an approximation correct up to order m inverse so the msc expression is correct only up to order m inverse and Prasad Rao gave an estimator so apparently it may appear it will be g1i a hat plus g2i a hat plus g3i a hat but that is wrong because expectation of g1i a hat is this thing so oh I can use this one that's good g3i g1i a minus g3i a plus little o m inverse so now if you want to estimate g1ia you should use g1ia hat plus g3i a hat and there you can do better that is a further refinement that Gori, John Rao and Gori student Smith so that one is good okay now most of the technical things are over we'll talk about first of all an interesting example estimation of median income of four person families the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services provides energy assistance to low-income families. Eligibility of the program is determined by a formula, but the most important variable is estimate of the current median income of four-person families. Just they call 51 states, the 50 states, and this is one way to give statehood to D.C., the District of Columbia. So 51 states, they call it. The Bureau of Census actually provides us estimates to Health and Human Services. So what is the data? S state medians for the current TSC as obtained from the current population survey. This is the dependent random variable. Then you use adjusted me census median. What is it? You go for the census year, the latest census, the recent most census year. For example, in 70 nine if you want to do you have to still go back to 1970 but that may not be very good things have changed so then adjust it the Bureau of Economic Analysis per capita income for the current year to the base year and that possibly should s seem obvious but they you may look like overfitting they also use B as a second independent variables so that using the B twice actually but they've got very good estimates and we followed their method and see how you can get estimates and it was really good that's surprised me the comparison based on four criteria there is a panel on small area estimates of populations National Academy of Science long time ago got it average relative bias average squared relative bias average absolute bias and average squared deviation and you can see in all the four criteria the sample median is the worst that is the current population survey estimate the old-fashioned bureau estimates actually what they did was better but not a whole lot better I mean it is better no question about it but the empirical base this is the last column they did better in every aspect the EB estimates so now this I'll gloss over I told you uh, Dr. Lahiri maximum likelihood or restricted um, max residual maximum likelihood whatever you want to call it then Partho and Rao they avoid normality assumption for random effects but assumed eighth moment in the Fahariot model. There are several papers, uh, Jiming Jiang, Partho, and others. And more recently, one of my favorite colleagues, Masao Yasimori, now she called Mas Hirose, and Partho, they have adjusted maximum likelihood. But one interesting thing is those who believe in conditional frequency inference, there are two articles, one by Jim Booth, my former colleague, and Jim Hobart conditional approach for estimating uh, MSC but now I come to the recent topic there is a lot more work done
from this model is just completely different. I've touched only possibly 1% or 2% of it in these days. I'll go to some of the more recent topics where I got involved. The model based model estimates, when aggregated, may not equal the corresponding estimate for the larger area, the typo is ST, estimate. Anyway, on the other hand, the direct estimate for a larger area, for example, the national level estimate is quite reliable. The median income we did for the states, the states are the small areas because the original survey was targeted at a national level. Okay. Now, matching the latter may be a good idea, for instance, to protect against model failure. For a scientist like me, that's the best thing. But there are very often political reasons because this is, I will give you one story. It is not here, but I will give you. Theta is the highest area mean, and you take that average, theta t, overall mean, known population of units for the jth area. So direct estimate is summation wj theta j hat, which is usually not equal to a model-based estimator because you won't get it. In order to do this, people have suggested model-based estimates, but what do you do? The model-based estimate, I, sh I should have said, the, which is usually not equal to a model-based estimator, and this is my story. As I told you, when I was working for the state of Florida, we designed the survey, 17,000 samples from 9,000 census block. The second year, they did not give the contract to us. They gave it to some other people to get estimates. Of course, they got estimates. I tried to impress possibly by using neural nets even, which I don't think was necessary at all. But anyway, when they got estimates from the census blocks, of course, they didn't and no way close. And at that time, they approached me. And not knowing anything better at that time, I said, OK, multiply all these by a factor so that you match the total. And the guy was very happy. The guy who was in charge of the project in the next year of the census block. And they were even ready to pay me for it <laughs> just by mentioning this multiply, I could get a couple of thousand dollars. <laughs> but later I understand. It is doing the right kind of thing. Look at it. Theta i hat ra, theta i hat m, which is that particular thing, as I was talking about. So you multiply, OK, by the wj, OK. so. Then what is happening? This thing will cancel out the theta i m and it will get the right thing, the model based estimator and the right thing. Or you adjust by the difference. And of course, there is criticism, very valid. I think Danny Pfefferman first raised it that a common adjustment is used for all small areas, regardless of their precision. And Wang, Fuller, and Chu, possibly one of the earliest ones, proposed instead in a survey methodology paper minimizing this particular quantity. So you have, you're not adjusting everybody by the same. Try to minimize this thing, not just minimize the mean squared error, subject to the conditions that your estimate, whatever the model based estimate is, it has to equal to the direct estimate for the larger area. And the resulting estimate, we are, I'm just giving it, this is the turned out, but you can see now, the key thing is, for the ith small area, you are not using just the direct thing. There is a factor lambda i, which is, the, which is based on the weights and also these fees. And Gauri, myself, uh, actually that is part of the dissertation of my favorite students, uh, Becca Stoltz and Jerry Mepples of the Census Bureau, took instead a general Bayesian approach and we minimize instead the posterior mean squared error subject to this same condition and abstain. Of course, we got essentially the similar estimators, except these are different. These are not the uh, uh, Fuller and others estimators. These are the base estimators. And we 
extend that uh, Becker in his in a dissertation to uh, multiple uh, uh, no the first one is multiple benchmarking this is one of my sabbatical visit to the US Census Bureau and I had a very revered colleague Bill Bell immediately he said let's work on this and Bill myself and Gauri of course at that time I was visiting I think we are visiting regularly those in those days I think Census Bureau so we have a biometric paper which extend the work of, in a, even in a frequentist context, to multiple benchmarking contexts. The other thing came in the PhD dissertation of Becker. And this was my experience, cash rent estimates of the National Agricultural Statistics Service, NAS, where I used to consult for about two, three years. I used to go there once a month and longer in summer uh, in Virginia. Now, of course, they have moved to the mainstream and I think near the central part of Washington. Anyway, the problem was you need the dual control of matching the aggregate of county level cash rent estimates to the corresponding agricultural district comprising several counties and the agriculture of the agricultural level estimates to the state level estimates. State is the biggest. But in one shot you have to do it. Pfefferman and others talked about two different models. One to match the first, for example, in this illustration, one to match the second. But they said they don't have the time even for that. They want to reproduce their results in a couple of weeks. So, actually, we found a method, a general method, which can serve the dual purpose. Actually, there are some applications also. The first paper with Becca appeared in test. That's a methodological paper, but nice application. Emily Birch of actually uh, National Agriculture at that time, Statistics Service, now a faculty at Iowa State. Will Susser, who is now with Westat. Andrea Ersulescu, at one time she was with the NAS, but not. There are two papers which adopted the approach of Groshen Stewart to address the NAS problem. The main thing was the NAS problem. But we had to use the two-stage thing. Now comes another thing. And it started by three people uh, questioning the need for random effects in all the small areas or whether even fixed effects would be adequate in certain areas. And the first one, believe me or not, this hall is Peter Hall. Once my call, uh, colleague Brett, Brett Presnell told me, Peter, the one area where Peter has worked in almost every area of statistics and probability, the one area he has not worked is mixed model. And I said, that is not no longer true. There is this paper and then later, at that time I think, no, even before that, he was writing papers with Tata Protomaiki, with mixed effects model. So Peter Hall got into mixed effects model through small area estimation. And indeed, Peter even attended one of the small area conferences in Bangkok, I remember. I'm very sorry to, he passed away at the age of 65 of cancer. A prolific and kind-hearted statistician. The fall of a gentle giant, I would say. But anyway, they suggested a preliminary test-based approach testing the null hypothesis that the common random effect variance was zero. Used a fixed or random effects model for small area, all or none, based on acceptance or rejection of the null. So this amounted, of course, this amounted to actually synthetic or regression estimates of small area means uh, upon acceptance of the null and composite estimators, weighted average uh, and regret otherwise. And that is a lot more work. Isabel Molina, Spain, John Rao, Gauri, and many others have worked on benchmarking. The interesting thing is the DHN works when the small area is moderately large, but not necessarily when the, it is very large. Because the null hypothesis of no random effects is very likely to be rejected when you have so many of them. For example, think about more than 3,000 counties of the United States. In such situation, the null hypothesis of no random effects very likely to be rejected, a few large residuals causing significant departure of direct estimates from the regression estimates. 
And Gauri being a smart person, and his colleague also is smart, Abhudha Mandal, they have a paper in Jasad. All these papers have appeared in Jasad, right? Because it, was, it became a new area at the time. More recent, as you can see, 2015, 2012, something like that. Who proposed instead a mixture model for random effects with spike and slap priors. What is spike and slap? The priors put a positive mass at zero, and they put the slap part, they put some distribution, normal. That's not my favorite, but it works quite often. This price puts a positive mass at zero, resulting in a spike at zero, slap part, normal, zero means. But common unknown variance, that's what they used. And this amounts to what? For the random effects you use, if I can get it here, delta ui instead of ui, and the delta is a Bernoulli with some probability. UIs are just like before. So in contrast to the spike and slab, of tongue, and that is another paper actually. You don't have to use just put all the mass at zero. You put two normals, one with a large variance, one with a small variance. They have a paper, Gauri student Adrijo uh, joined them. Now, the, in contrast to the spike and slap priors of Gauri and Abuda, uh, Xing Tang, one of my favorite students, myself, Nung Ha, when I started in Samsi, when I was talking, uh, thinking about it, uh, and Joe Sedransk, we considered a different class of priors, which meets the same objective, but inst instead use absolutely continuous priors. These priors allow different variance components for different small areas, and intend to capture the local small area effects better, who consider it to be the zero or common across small areas, because they're not exact zero. What you should be able to do you should get posterior estimates of those area level effects. And this approach does give the posterior estimates of the area level effects. And this was very, very important. Particularly useful when the number of small areas is very large, for example, more than 3,000 counties, and one expects a wide variation in the county effects. I'm almost about my time. Nitish, can I get another five or six minutes? Thank you very much. I appreciate it. The proposed class of priors is usually referred to as global local shrinkage priors, and these are the people who started. I don't claim any originality there. But the interesting thing is they are scale mixtures of normal. They are heavy tail. So for example, forget small area estimation. If you are, say, in high energy physics, where you are trying to detect a few signals in the midst of multiple noises, or in genetics, where there are millions of genes but only a few specific ones are responsible for type 1 diabetes is a sparse situation, and they work perfectly. Capture potential sparsity, which is lack of significant contribution by many of the random effects in this context, assigning large probabilities to random effects close to zero, but also identifying random effects which differ significantly from zero. And how is it achieved? Very simple. Two levels of parameters to express prior variances of random effects. The first, the local shrinkage parameters act at individual levels. I at area, there is a parameter. Say, call it lambda. I've given the formula. And there is a global parameter which tries to shrink everything, one, one general thing. So Fay and Harriet, just one global parameter. Gauri and his colleagues, uh, random effects either zero, but then, of course, but we are using this kind of thing, lambda i square a. The lambda i squares are capturing the local area effect. The a is capturing the global area effect. So while a tries to cause an overall shrinking effect, the local shrink, uh, shrinkage parameters, lambda i, are trying to protect it, actually. Uh, appropriately heavy-tailed, as I was saying, scale mixtures of normals is really good. Uh, that large random effects are almost left unshrunk. I've given a whole bunch of references. The most well-known in this class is horseshoe, although we have seen in our calculation with real data that sometimes, especially Xing Tang and myself, that horseshoe, there are many others which can do better than horseshoe. This is an interesting thing, uh, the application. Five-year county-level overall poverty estimates for 31, 41, 
3141 count is in the data set. Confidence are simple, just one. Go, uh, intercept and food stamp participation rate. And we found for all the counties identified, because the counties could be identified. It was great. So poverty ratios was Borden County in Texas between 3.3, that's the smallest. The highest one's Shannon County in South Dakota, poverty ratios, 47.9. The median was 14.7. Then, based on that, we went to the state level. We went to Mississippi, Georgia, Alabama, New Mexico. 55% or more counties have poverty rates bigger than the third quarter. But you'll be glad, in New Hampshire, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Wyoming, Hawaii, and New Jersey, 70% of the counties have poverty rates below the first quarter. So this is maybe a good news, possibly, for people in this room. There's a picture, which possibly doesn't mean much as such a, a more recent one, variable transformation. The normality assumption can be justified only after transformation of the original data. This is essentially my last topic. Then one performs analysis based on the transformed data, but transform back properly to the original scale to arrive at the final conclusion. One common example is skewed positive data, make the log transformation log normal and started with SLUD and MITI uh, with the usual squared or loss. Myself and Kubokawa, actually, in our biometric paper, but took a different kind of loss, a general Bregman kind of loss, and provided back through. That is one interesting thing I want to point out. And there is a common misconception. So take a multiplicative model, make the log transformations, use the Fahariot, for the log transform. And a natural thing for most people, I've seen people giving this kind of talk, they said, okay, I have got the estimates with the log, just exponentiate and we'll get it. But here is the problem. That will give you biased estimates. Why? Because think about it. Theta i has a normal posterior, right? This is what it is. Now take a expectation of phi i. Phi i is exponential theta i given zi. So what is the moment? The moments of log normal variable are moment generating function of a normal variable. And that leads to not only this estimate, which you would like to exponentiate, but here, that extra factor, the bias. So unless you use that, you are not getting it properly. So another ex interesting ex example, which I'm working now, I, we have already two papers. Uh, the binomial NIPI, we use the arc sign transformation. The idea is we don't have to go through now, even for the area level models, to assume known DIs. Once you make the transformation, what is happening? Uh, arc sign transformation, the ZIs are became independent, normal theta I 1 over NI. Theta I is sine inverse 2 PI minus 1, just to make it symmetric. Back transformation correctly you'll get it and do the inference. And there is a paper accepted, but due to appear very soon, I think, in Statistica Seneca by Masao Hirose, myself, and my student, Tamal Ghosh. He worked on this area. Then also we worked on the Poisson model, independent Poisson lambda i, take the square root transformation, you get the independent normal theta i quarter, but then you have to do the right kind of back transformation. So added advantages, known DI, can be avoided. And that's it. And now I have listed a whole bunch of topics. As I said, I have covered only a minuscule portion of it, but there is so much. Design consistency, model design synthesis, very important for survey statisticians. People like us, of course, we can do whatever we want, but the people who are actually working the agencies, federal agencies and others, the genuine service, they like to see whether the sampling design, the model and the design can be somehow synthesized. Space, time models, measurement errors in the covariates. I've started working on that right now. I have worked with it before. Gauri has worked with it. Partha, you may have worked with it also. I can, have you worked with it? Measurement errors? Maybe you have. 
uh, I don't know. Poverty counts, I talked about it. Empirical base confidence, and so on, all three of us, Bartho, myself, Gauri worked on it. Roval, smaller estimation. Uh, actually, I first worked on it. It's a very sad thing. As I mention it, I think of my old student and friend, Dalo Kim. He is the first person with which I started Roval, smaller estimation. Only two days ago, last Monday, I got the news that he passed away suddenly. Very, very sad. It was one of the most shocking events for me because I worked with him even beyond his area of dissertation. About 15 years, even she possibly graduated around 94, 95, but possibly even until 2010, I was constantly work with him. A very sad thing. But he's the first person I started robust small area. I mean, Gauri Partho have worked, of course, even before that, but Dalo is the person I, I started on robust small area. Misspecification of linking models, we are working on that. Informative sampling, the constrained small area estimation. And the second cousin of small area estimation, I hijacked the word from my friend Joseph Rance, is disease mapping, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you very much. At the end, um, I will just say that Professor Ghosh promised to give a talk on small area estimation, but looking at the topics, I don't think there is anything small about it. It is huge, and the lecture was enlightening, and uh, thank you for uh, giving this fantastic lecture for all of us here, and for safekeeping in the uh, ASS archive. Thank you. short video from I can come I can watch it Malay right. this on behalf time, of the like board of directors of the American Statistical Association the I congratulate you on this recognition and thank you for your Ron Wasserstein <clears throat> 
Malay, on behalf of the Board of Directors of the American Statistical Association, I congratulate you on this recognition and thank you for your wonderful address. The ASA is a longtime supporter of this colloquium, and I've been personally involved for many years. It is a real privilege and honor to be in the same room, as it were, with the great colleagues featured in this colloquium, such as Malay. He is, of course, a giant in our profession, but I suspect he is most proud, not of his own work, but that many of his students have gone on to have huge impacts, both in academe and industry. His earliest student, though, is not one you will find on the Mathematics Genealogy Project or some similar resource. Malay's son, Debashis, told me, and I quote, my dad would read books on U statistics to my mom's belly when they were expecting me. The subject matter isn't surprising. Malay was a student of PK Sen, but the pedagogy is a bit unusual. That seems to have worked though, since Debashis is a PhD biostatistician and chair of the Department of Biostatistics and Informatics at the Colorado School of Public Health. Malay, it is such an honor and joy to know you and have this opportunity to congratulate you. Best wishes. That was wonderful. Ron was here this past weekend for our department's 60th anniversary and couldn't travel again for this, unfortunately, but we are grateful for his recorded message. And now we have someone else who, we'd like to, uh, who would like to share some words of congratulations on behalf of Pfizer. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Nataraja to the stage, please. Thank you. For those of us actually, uh, my colleagues actually are joining from Pfizer, this is um, truly a, a week that has been actually a celebration of statistics. Um, we just concluded at Pfizer actually the Global Statistical Conference, which an annual event, uh, and just a two and a half day event. Um, and yesterday, uh, believe it or not, we had another Bayesian uh, who is also a Nobel laureate, uh, 2021 Nobel laureate in econometrics, uh, Guido Embens, uh, who talked about actually uh, on, a, on a plenary session and joined us actually from Stanford. Um, so today, another great Bayesian uh, who I had actually the privilege uh, being actually under and uh, got my thesis as well. So as a former student of uh, Professor Malai Ghosh, it is my great honor and great pleasure to congratulate him on his selection to be this year's speaker uh, of the Distinguished Statistics Colloquium. A very timely and a very well-deserved recognition of his uh, impactful contributions as a researcher and an educator. Many of his current and former students, of which actually there are four of us uh, here in this room, and call him affectionately Molaida. And for those of you who don't know, saying it's Molaida, actually it's Da, it's essentially it's an, it's a recognition as him as an older brother, as a guide, as a, as a mentor for all of us. I still call him Sir, bearing the utmost respect um, of not just his significant academic achievements, but as an individual who stands, who stands tall in all respects. I'm elated to note that recognition and promotion of excellence in research as well as innovation constitute an integral component of Pfizer score values. Therefore, Pfizer takes profound pride in co-sponsoring the symposium, joining hands with the University of Connecticut and Ron Wassenstein and, uh, and the American Statistical Association. The symposium that has played a critical role over the years uh, in recognizing the contributions of pioneers in the field of statistics. In addition to co-sponsoring uh, this symposium, Pfizer has also an unwavering uh, commitment to promoting the field of uh, statistics and the training of the next generation of uh, statisticians through fellowship programs and summer internship programs. Uh, indeed, we have a very vibrant summer internship program that usually brings uh, graduate students from uh, University of Connecticut uh, into Pfizer, providing the students an opportunity to work and experience in the pharmaceutical industry. In addition, we have consulting partnerships with the UConn faculty, as well as Pfizer colleagues saving serving here as actually adjunct faculty as well in the, uh, in the academic industry partnership. Recently, we also initiated uh, the Pfizer Statistics Fellowship Program, 
which has been near and dear to me uh, and is uh, with major universities, one of which is the University of Florida, my alma mater, uh, including Boston as well as Indiana University. Uh, and very soon with the University of Connecticut, which we, have, we, we had conversations with Professor Deepak Day uh, at the JSM, with the aim of un attracting underrepresented students to the research and application of statistics, uh, science, and drug development. As I mentioned previously in a very similar occasion, Pfizer statisticians have, of course, a long history of impact uh, and influence both in the application and theoretical development of statistical science. Since Wilcoxon and Dunnett, and those of you who have used the Wilcoxon statistics and Dunnett made their groundbreaking contributions in the Letterly Labs in what is now called the Pearl River uh, site of Pfizer in New York City, in New York. Pfizer statisticians have continued to be engaged in the deployment of cutting edge methods uh, in the search of breakthrough medicines, such as the recent uh, uh, coronavirus uh, vaccine, Comirnaty, and as well as the antiviral uh, treatment Paxlovid that has been instrumental in fighting uh, against the pandemic, and thankfully that we are here today uh, face to face. Coming back to this colloquium, um, unsurprisingly, some of the past honorees of this distinguished statistical colloquium included some prominent figures, uh, such as Professor C.R. Rao and Professor Pranab Sen, uh, and Dr. Malai Dagosh actually talked about it, who were either Malai's colleagues as well as collaborators or mentors. I personally am excited to see the recognition of Malai, whose numerous contributions, consisting of two books, as Professor Nitish Mukhopadhyay mentioned, and more than 250 research collaborations and publications. And I'm sure that's more because it's more of an underestimation. It has been invaluable uh, among many uh, statisticians, certainly actually among, as my, my colleague uh, Demisi Pomkai pointed out, uh, it extends beyond the small area uh, as, as statistics into actually uh, now in the field of uh, artificial intelligence as well. Notable examples of the impact of his work include hierarchical Bayesian uh, modeling and statistical inference for case control studies uh, that, con that continue to transform the way that we analyze and report uh, clinical trials as well. As mentioned by Professor Nitish Mukhopadhyay, according to the Mathematics uh, Genealogy Project, um, Professor Malai Ghosh has over 27 PhD students, but which is clearly an underestimate, uh, including myself, and at least 66 descendants. However, based on other sources and actual number of PhD students, he has supervised perhaps over 50 uh, students. Likewise, he has numerous accolades over the years, including the Samuel S. Wilkes uh, Memorial Award, elected fellow of the IMS, as well as the American Statistical Association, elected member of the Indian uh, International Statistical uh, Institute. Perhaps one of um, Malloy's most remarkable contributions, which probably not very many of you know, not known to many of his colleagues, is his engagement in fostering the field of statistics in developing countries. For example, he has been an active and frequent participant uh, of the annual African International Conference of Statistics. And over the years, um, he has traveled to different parts of Africa, including Ethiopia, South Africa, and other countries of the continent as a keynote speaker. On a personal note, Malai Ghosh, or I call a sir, as I affectionately call, still call him, uh, was more than a teacher or advisor. But he, along with his wife, Doladi, who I'm very happy to see here, were parent guardians for many of the students like me who came in far and abroad with no immediate family uh, members close by. His humility, constant drive for continued excellence, his energy, his passion, not just in statistics, but in other areas such as tennis, bridge, card game. And by the way, for those of you who don't know, he was actually, a, I believe, a national champion in bridge at some point and, and, and represented actually at a number of uh, tournaments as well. These are admirable traits that I try to emulate in a, at least in a very small manner. So let us thank Professor Malai Ghosh for his multifaceted contributions over the years and wish him good health and fortitude as he continues to enrich the field of statistics and the family of statisticians with this wisdom, experience, and steadfast commitment of research and education. Thank you on behalf of Pfizer, thank you on behalf of University of Connecticut, and behalf of American Statistical Association as well. Thank you so much, that was wonderful.
Um, at this point, we will take a break. Uh, do we, we're already at, well, we could still, is this clock correct? 3.55? Professor Day, do you want to cut it shorter, or should we? We'll, we'll have a short intermission. Uh, we'll call you in uh, before uh, we, we begin the interview portion, but in the meantime, we have a lovely video. So please feel free, but we'll have this on in the background. <laughs> <laughs> 